everybody can hear me okay? Okay, great. I'm afraid to move. Um, <laughs> that's okay, I got my right hand. Uh, so Ad Health, uh, the, it's, um, as Jim said, uh, it's a national longitudinal study of adolescent or adult, adult health. Um, this is an ongoing program project um, that began in 1994. Uh, it's funded by uh, NIH um, and 23 other um, agencies, um, well, 23 federal agencies within NIH um, and across the government. And it was actually developed in response to a congressional mandate to fund a study of adolescent health. Um, and the mandate was to try to understand the role of the social environments in which adolescents live. So that's important because the design is based on, on that. Um, when we were developing ad health in the early 90s, most of the research on adolescents uh, just focused on the individual, sort of devoid of, um, of their context. And you know, what we endeavored to do in the design of ad health was to try to place the individual in their various contexts with their peers, in the school setting, with their families, and in, in dyadic relationships, both friendships and romantic relationships. And so that was the, that was the design. I'll show you what that is. Um, so this, uh, the purpose was to try to understand the causes of health and health behavior in adolescents and their outcomes in adulthood. It's a multi-serving, multi-wave, interdisciplinary design. Uh, the, uh, we have direct measurement of the social context, and I'll show you, I'll show you that in a second. Um, there's also unprecedented racial and ethnic diversity, um, and we have genetically informed sibling samples as well as um, extensive biomarker collection across all the ways. So some of what I will show you is relevant um, to um, the network data uh, and the IRB issues that brings up, and other parts is just for your information so you, you know everything there is to know about ad health. Here's the, here's the wave one sampling structure. Um, what we did is we selected 80 high schools from a list of all high schools in the United States. So that's all schools, um, private, uh, public, magnet, um, special ed. And, um, and then we also selected a feeder school to those high schools uh, based on the probability of the, uh, con the contribution of the student proportion to that high school. So we end up with a pair of 80. Um, I, we end up with a pair of either middle or, or um, junior high school and a high school in 80 different communities across the United States. We went into these schools and we administered a really brief in-school questionnaire um, that asked general um, sort of questions, nothing really too sensitive, but it served the basis on which we were able to then select other samples. Um, so for example, um, we asked uh, adolescents in the in-school questionnaire to nominate their five best male friends and their five best as female friends and just select them off of the school roster, you know, put their number down. And that's how we get the, um, the peer network measures. Um, we also collected information about um, the race, ethnicity, um, disability status, um, sibling structure, um, and then that also allowed us to select some of these uh, special samples. So then, um, you know, using the, uh, the school rosters, of the schools uh, that we interviewed, we then went in and we selected a, uh, a grade and gender stratified sample of 200 students from each school pair. So that represents this main sample. Um, it's really basically self-weighting. And then as I mentioned, on the basis of answers to the in-school questionnaire, we oversampled certain groups. We oversampled a high education black sample. These are African-American students with uh, um, at least one parent with a college um, degree. We oversampled Puerto Rican, Chinese, and Cuban adolescents. We have a disabled um, oversample. These are primarily physical disabilities. Uh, we have these genetic samples um, where we, in fact, uh, you know, every time we found identical twins, we took them. So we sampled them at 100%. Uh, same with and then some fraternal twins. We oversampled. Um, we didn't oversample full sibs because they actually occur in pretty large numbers um, within the sample. Um, but we did oversample half sibs and then also adolescents who grew up in the same household but had no genetic resemblance, so adopted kids and, and um, uh, step siblings. And then we have a saturated samples. And so what these are is in two large schools and 14 small schools, rather than sampling from the school rosters, we just took all the kids in these schools and 
uh, made them part of this, what, what we call, this is called the in-home sample. Um, and these saturated samples then, uh, they give us the, you know, even though the adolescents nominate their five best male friends and female friends in the in-school, uh, they're only sampled at a rate of about two of nine, so not all of their friends end up in the in the in-home questionnaire, um, with the exception of the saturated samples. So all of the friends, all the peer networks uh, that are mentioned in the in-school questionnaire are in these saturated samples. And in the saturated samples in the in-home interview, we also asked our adolescents to nominate their sexual partners and their romantic partners, and so they're also in the sample, and you can uh, model the full sexual networks in these schools. So that's, that's, the, that's the overall design. Let me see what comes next. Um, and that's what gives us this contextual um, design and data. Uh, we have the peer networks from the nomination of friends. We have the school context um, because we have um, you know, we have all of the measures in the in-school questionnaire that were asked of all students. So basically, that's a census school. That's a school census. We can aggregate up on those measures. We also interviewed a school administrator, who gives us information about the school. Uh, we have the family network um, uh, because when uh, when we sampled adolescents, we also sampled a parent. Uh, so um, a parent was also interviewed, primarily the mother. Um, and we also have, you know, siblings. And then the neighborhood uh, context is obtained by uh, geocoding the addresses of the adolescents' um, homes and then merging in contextual data that comes from multiple um, sources like the census, the CDC, uh, religious denomination information, uh, um, federal crime statistics, and so on. So that's... Uh, um, well, let me, let me go through this and then see if you have any questions about the design. Um, so the, the network data then, uh, I just mentioned the nomination, the five best male and female friends, um, the romantic partners, and then um, we have a nomination of the best friend in both the wave one and the wave two in-home interview. Um, and then um, the saturated samples. Uh, okay, so I haven't actually, uh, I haven't showed you what the longitudinal design looks like and what we do at, wave, at waves two through five, but I'll show you that in a second. Um, but we have a couple sample that we had that we got at wave three. Um, and then uh, we also, at wave three, asked about continuing contact with the friends that they nominated back in the in-school questionnaire. So let me see. Oh, this is the question. Let me show. Let me show you. The, uh, th these were the actual questions that were asked. Please tell me the name of your best uh, of your five best male friends, starting with your best male friend first. Um, if you have a boyfriend, also list him first, um, and then vice versa uh, for the females. So, any questions so far on just the design of ad health? Yeah. Um, it was just at wave three, yeah, yeah. And I'll show you. I'll show you that. Okay. So here's. Let me give you some, you know, illustrations of what can be done. Uh, this actually comes out of an article that that Jim Moody wrote. Um, you know, this is a uh, um, a sample school that um, that is referred to as countryside school district. Um, and what's really you know, nice about this is this shows all of the all of the friendship friendship um, linkages, um, but also just the the segregation of these linkage of these linkages by uh, this is race. So the yellow uh, circles are white, the green are, are black, and the uh, the red are mixed race um, or um, let's say other. So that's primarily where you find the Hispanic um, and Asian groups and. So, you know, what you can see is not surprisingly that um, you find that the whites and the black friendship uh, linkages are um, clustered together. And then the different, the two different, and then the, um, the mixed and other races are sort of somewhat mixed, you know, in between. And then the other two clusters represent the, the high school uh, versus like the middle school. 
that's a great illustration. Um, this is some of the race and ethnic diversity, I mean, just for your interest. Because we oversampled a certain ethnic groups, we, we really end up with tremendous diversity. You can look at the sample. This is uh, coming from wave one, um, uh, where uh, there's nine different race and ethnic groups. Uh, that And this, these are the, the ends. And then th these are the weighted percentages, which is you know, what their percentages really were in the, in the population um, around 1995. Um, so you can see there are sufficient numbers from, uh, you know, Chinese, 341, I suppose, is probably the smallest, uh, Puerto Rican, um, Cuban, uh, and so on. And these can actually even be broken down by um, generation, by immigrant generation. And then we also get uh, quite a lot of diversity in terms of the family structure because of the genetic oversamples. Uh, we have, uh, um, you know, Step families, for example, can be broken down according to which parent is the bio parent. You know, we've got over 600 kids who grew up in a single father family and about 1,500 who, uh, who are living with the surrogate parent, which is basically no, they have no biological parent in the household. Um, they're growing up either with aunts or uncles or grandparents or they're in foster homes. And this is another just illustrative example. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, in terms of, because I haven't told you what else is in the data, um, but this is a really cool um, type of analysis um, that uh, we've been doing um, in Ad Health um, on social genetic effects. So I'm going to show you that we collect uh, DNA data a little bit later on, and what we can do with the DNA data is we can create um, these indexes of, um, it's called a, a polygenic score, um, and it's an index of all the sort of um, genetic variants um, that have been found in the literature to be associated with, it, with a particular outcome. Um, and here we're looking at the outcomes of years of education, BMI, and height. And so each individual, based on their genetic data, can have this polygenic score. You could think of it as a propensity you know, for education or a propensity for um, obesity or high BMI. Um, and this can be measured, of course, at the individual level, which is shown in the gray, gray bars here. But it can also be measured among their peers and among their, uh, the grade mates in their schools or among their schoolmates. Um, and so what you can do is estimate, you know, okay, what's the association between an individual's uh, propensity for obtaining high education? Um, and over and above your own propensity for high education, you know, what about the genetic effects of your friends, the people who are around you, um, their propensity for high education. And what we find is really pretty interesting that, um, so the, 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 the red, the dashed red bar is um, the bivariate association between the polygenic score um, and the outcome for the individual. And then once you uh, enter controls, you know, you get some reduction of the individual effect. But what's really interesting is that you know, there's a really pretty high and significant effect of the genes of your friends. That's why we call them social genetic effects um, on your own education. Um, and the, the friendship, the, 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 um, the schoolmates is an even higher um, association. And again, what you see is that you know, this is important for education. You might think of it as a more social outcome. Um, it's not quite as important for BMI, the social genetic effects, the genes of your, of, your, um, you know, um, of your friends and your schoolmates. And then for height, of course, it's, it's pretty much not even there. Again, just a, a fun, cool thing to do with the network data. OK, so let me talk a little bit about some of the IRB issues, and then we'll go into like the rest of the design. Um, so you know, the main things, of course, with almost all uh, research like this is protecting the confidentiality of the respondent's identity, um, and protecting the confidentiality of friendship and partner nominations, uh, minimizing deductive disclosure risks, and I'll talk about all of these. And then all three of these issues combined uh, with very wide dissemination um, of highly sensitive data. So highly sensitive data are just the, you know, the types of um, you know, outcomes and behaviors that we um, collect um, that, that, that our respondents report on in terms of illegal behavior, potentially drug use, um, sexual behavior, and so on. Um, so, you know, right from the start of bad health, there's extremely strong motivation for sharing the data. 
Uh, it was very expensive was at the time in 1994. It was the most expensive. It was the highest grant um, that was ever funded by NICHD. It cost the most. And the one thing that they wanted is to make sure that it wasn't going to be used by like five people um, at UNC. And so we sort of made an agreement you know, early on that we would be disseminate this data as widely as possible. We would not hold back any data. Um, we pretty much have followed that. Um, you know, other motivations, it's actually representative. Uh, the design, really, there was no study at that time. We really had these direct measures of the social environment. Um, and it, you know, it, it was, Ad Health is a study that has a lot of breadth, maybe not so much depth, but it covers a lot of different domains, a lot of different uh, disciplines in terms of their interests. Um, but, you know, we don't have the, you know, we don't have the 200 item scales that some of the psychologists wish we had. We had like the five item one. Um, and, and, you know, the longitudinal data helps with uh, the temporal ordering of things. So we, we, we came to this agreement that, there, that the investigators would not have any proprietary use. As soon as we got the data and it was ready for analysis, we, gave it, uh, we would uh, give it out to the world. And we've continued this. Um, the, only, you know, the, only, um, the only way that we've changed this is when it's biological data, um, we uh, have a year of proprietary use. Because often with biological data, there's only one and one hypothesis that can be examined. Um, and the biological data are gotten for that to address that one hypothesis. So we give investigators a year to at least address, address that. that. Um, so, so some of the really things that worried us. Um, the contextual nature of the, of the design. Uh, you know, what this means is you know, we didn't um, sample individuals. We sampled contexts. And then we studied people within those contexts. Um, and so what that meant is that everybody in those contexts, particularly the schools, knew that each other were, were also in the survey. And not only did the adolescents know that their classmates uh, were in the, stu in the uh, study, but so did all the parents in the community, so did all the teachers in the community, so did all the school administrators. I think we estimated that there were 350,000 people who knew, you know, uh, respondents in the study. Um, so that was a, that was a concern. We have third-party nominations of friends and romantic partners. Um, I have that there. Um, and we never got consent. So when you're, you know, if the adolescent is taking the survey and they nominate their sexual partner, you know, that partner doesn't consent, um, is never given the opportunity to consent to whether or not they can be brought into the survey. And these, are, these first three things are really what worried us the most. Um, we have the geocodes of adolescents, you know, home address. That's fairly straightforward to deal with. Um, you know, we just don't ever release the geocodes. Um, and then, of course, the very sensitive nature of the, of the data. And then with each additional wave, um, the security risks increase. You know, more information allows you to figure out who's in the study. Any questions about these issues? OK. Um, so this is the Pledge of Confidentiality that we gave to our uh, participants. Um, I, and uh, you know, this is on the consent form. I understand that my statements and answers will be completely protected so that no one will be able to connect my answers to me. My answers will not be given to my parents, my guardians, to any unauthorized person by project staff. So the, the, the pledge here is that their answers will never be connected to them. <coughs> Okay, so the, what are the risks here? The first risk, of course, is direct disclosure. Um, and then this is, of course, you know, linking the, the name um, uh, uh, with the questionnaire information, the responses. Um, and then there's deductive disclosure. Um, and that's when you, uh, you figure out, you discern a person's identity and the responses through uh, use of known characteristics of that person. So Ad Health is especially um, at high risk of deductive disclosure because of the cluster design. Like I said, you know, 350,000 people knew a respondent in the survey. If that was a father and they knew their daughter was in the survey, um, it wouldn't take them long to figure out, uh, identify their daughter, um, get the, you know, get a, you know, use a few characteristics of the data we collected to get to that a person in, in uh, a, one person in a cell. <coughs> Um, oh, I have 400,000. Okay. 
Okay, so here's an example. We ran these examples constantly, which made us more and more nervous and almost paralyzed us to do anything. <laughs> um, but, you know, we've got 90,000 cases. I actually forgot to give you the, in the in-school administration. So in those 80, in the 80 communities that had two schools, uh, the participation, the number of cases is about 90,000. And it only takes five variables to distinguish as few as seven respondents. And so here's an example. You know, you just, you get female, limit the age to 18, Asian, does not live with a father figure, participates in chorus. And so you can imagine how easy it would be to add one more variable, you know, um, uh, does not speak English at home uh, to come up with one person. Um, okay, so what do we do? Well, we use this, what we call a data management security plan that protects against the breach of confidentiality from both direct and um, deductive disclosure. Um, it also protects us from subpoena um, or hostile sharing. We were really worried about subpoena um, in the 90s because there was a, a fair amount of political um, interest and movement in closing down um, any type of study that asks sensitive questions um, uh, of adolescents and in particular sexual behavior questions. Uh, we also have a certificate of confidentiality which is supposedly supposed to protect you against subpoena as well. <clears throat> um, so the protections from deductive, uh, sorry, from direct disclosure are uh, pretty straightforward. It's based on the separation of identities and data. Um, and basically, what, the way we do this is the names and the addresses of respondents reside with a security manager, which is also called an honest broker, who just holds the identifying information. Um, and, it, and our security manager is outside the U.S. Um, and then the identifying information is only in the U.S. during data collection. And we don't have it. I don't have it. Um, you know, we run out health out of the Carolina Population Center. We don't have any of that information. Um, the information goes right to our field contractor, who is uh, RTI, and then they use that information to make the appointments and try to get the interviews. Um, so we never, I don't know the names of anybody um, um, in, in the study. Um, you know, sometimes actually respondents will email me because um, they can, you know, they're now um, in their 30s. They're quite savvy. Um, they could, might even be in this room. Um, and... <laughs> And then will say to me, oh, I hear you know, another wave is coming. Please don't forget me. Or one time, one emailed me. Um, I think they got their like, graduate degree at NC State and engineer. I forget. You know, and I get those emails, and I'm there, ah! You know, and so I immediately pass them on to RTI and then just you know, delete it from the system. And I never remember anybody's name. <laughs> um, so, um, so. And then we use the, we have a very complex ID number um, that, alters the I, that alters the ID depending on what the sample is, and that also helps us protect in terms of direct disclosure. And so basically the names are never really connected to the data. I think this shows the next, yeah, so here, here's an example, wave uh, four. You know, we've got the field ID. We, you know, on the, on the data, for those who are ad health users, you probably know there is an ID. It helps you connect the data across all the waves and ancillary studies and biomarkers. That's called an AID. But when we're in the field, <coughs> they're given a different ID. Um, and then the connection between the AID and all these IDs is outside the US. Um, that's a field. We've got the field ID. We've got the biospecimen ID. Uh, wave 4, we collected different. We also collected cortisol. We've got a household ID. Uh, we uh, got military records for those who consented. Um, and gave us a social security number to get the uh, military records, uh, the questionnaire ID, and then a school ID, which was, um, which was actually the original ID that we used to try, try to help us out. I had the AID right up here. So that's, you know, that's how we do this. Um, and I should say that we're actually, and this might be you know, informative to Jim, I mean, it took us a long time to come up with these plans. Uh, you know, um, you know, I'd like to say years, but probably it was maybe not years. Maybe it was, I mean, it was definitely months or a year to make us feel comfortable um, about releasing the data. Um, and so this has been in place, and our identifiers have been out of the country for, um, you know, almost 25 years. And we're just now um, thinking about bringing the identifying information into the U.S. We have the same honest broker, so the separation 
but it has been quite cumbersome to you, you know, to go through this process um, of linking IDs and sending the identifying information to your contractor, especially now as we go to more continuous interviewing. So um, it was really the stage of adolescence that got us pretty worried. Um, so let me talk a little bit about deductive disclosure and then the so the way that we deal with deductive disclosure, as you see, as you saw, was it's pretty easy. Um, we, we, come up, we came up with the tiered data dissemination plan, and basically, it just we release the data according to the level of the risk of deductive disclosure, and then requirements for access and use of the data differ by the level of risk. Um, so ad health users then have to meet like requirements and assurances for safeguarding the data, and then users also have to provide by these procedures that we lay out to you know, to follow their security plan. Um, and then access to all of the data, um, the restricted data, um, are uh, come up with a, um, a legal contract that is made between the University of North Carolina and the institution or organization where the researcher resides. So we have four tiers. The first is public use. This does not include any of the friendship or romantic pair linkages, so maybe not as in much interest to you. Um, the public use is great because it's a 50% sample of the core sample plus 50% uh, of the African American um, uh, um, high education over sample. And uh, the reason that we feel comfortable with releasing this publicly, I mean, you can just get it on the CD, is that um, nobody can, you can never be sure that you, you know, since it's only 50% of the sample, if you find somebody that you think might be somebody you're trying to find in the sample, you can never be sure. Um, and then we have, uh, then we come to restricted use, <clears throat> which um, really is all the data, but not the romantic pairs. So the romantic pairs are the adolescents who nominated their sexual romantic partners. Yeah. Um, then we have high security restricted data, which includes the romantic pairs. And then uh, very high sensitive data can be obtained through the secure data facility. And that's the high school transcript data. Um, it's also where you can use geocodes to link to um, other uh, contextual data or ancillary data. Okay. Um, so you may not be able to see that, but this is what this is what it looks like. Yeah, this is the public use, and then it tells you what's in each of these. Um, direct identifiers are, of course, not in any any of these uh, tiered uh, dissemination, and the geographic coordinate coordinates are only available in the secure data facility, but only for linking purposes. Nobody goes away with those. Uh, and we have neighborhood characteristics, individual characteristics, sensitive data. And then these are what it, some of the requirements are. All you have to do is sign in a, a, a pledge of confidentiality in the public use data. Um, and then uh, the rest require contractual um, agreement, a little proposal, a data security plan. Your security plan has to be approved by your IRB um, and so on. And then what the data users have to do is um, they have to sign the Pledge of Confidentiality, agree to monitoring of data use, store the data security. Um, you have to delete your temporary data analysis files every six months um, and uh, you know, make sure that you, the printed information is secure, so on. Um, and, what, and then you know, one of the things that we do, uh, we, have, we charge for um, adult data. Um, I don't think it's, it's very um, expensive. Um, I think for all five, now five uh, waves, it's like $1,000. Um, and then what we do is we use that money to host a, a um, user's conference every other year, um, and which where you know, we teach people about the different aspects of the data, and users can present their data. And we also use it to come and do site visits. So we you know, will visit a university or a city where we have a lot of users, and we just go around to make sure people are following their security plans. Um, and for the most part, I mean, users are, you know, we've never found anything. We, actually, every site visit, we have always found something that users are doing wrong. They're not following the security plan, but it's never intentional. Um, the users are always very happy to have us come and say, oh, you know, you're, you know, this, you know, you'd be better if you did it this way, or, you know, this isn't quite in compliant, just do this. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk now about the rest of the longitudinal data and sort of, you know, show you how what we set up back in 1995, 96 has been able to accommodate, you know, the data that we've been continuing to collect. Are there any questions at this point? 
Yeah. Um, I guess I was just going to add. Um, yeah. Have, have this, uh, the uh, data management security plan been used in the group of other studies or is it better on a smaller scale? Is it like a real team? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, you know, we you know, we were really the first study to bring attention to deductive disclosure risk. Almost every study, the PSID, the NLSY, you know, uses a you know a sort of higher level aggregate sampling unit, um, like um, a, you know a household or gosh, I can't remember what the, the unit is. Um, you know, just a geographic area that creates the same sort of deductive disclosure risks. And so, um, so I think studies are now much more sensitive to the deductive disclosure risk, um, seems to be um, you know, coming around. Uh, other studies, I mean, LA fans just took verbatim our, you know, our, um, you know, this plan. If you, anybody uses LA fans, this is exactly what they use and it came from Ad Health. So, you know, we were really happy to have other people follow, um, you know, follow these, this thinking because it took us a long time to come up with it, and we think it's pretty solid. So um, the fact that studies are now very sensitive to these disclosure risks. I mean, when we we had our when we had our um, our users, you know, have to go through the IRB to approve their security plan. The IRBs would you know kick it back and say, "Why are you sending this to us?" And you know, we had to say, you know, because of this deductive disclosure risk, this is a real risk that you can identify somebody. So we also felt like we educated the IRBs. You know, maybe we did too good of a job. I mean, now of course, you know, <laughs> sort of like that's the way it goes. You know, the pendulum. But yeah. I have two questions. Um, one question: Did you have to do any sort of mandatory reporting if a if a respondent said they were being abused or right? Yeah. So you did. And then, no. Um, I mean, I'll answer that. Yeah. And then, did you give people the option to choose multiple races? And how did you? Yeah. Uh, uh, handle that in your data sets when, you're, when you did like the race and ethnicity breakdown? Right, yeah. No, that's a good question. So um, we did everything that we could <clears throat> to avoid ha having to do any reporting to the state level. So we never asked about abuse or neglect until our respondents were past age 18. So we asked at wave three, kind of retrospectively, we also asked at wave four. Um, and we tested, we collected urine and saliva at wave three to test for STIs, um, HIV, and um, actually I can tell you a story about that. Um, and we argued that our pledge of confidentiality meant that we didn't have to report. Um, and that, that was a very tense situation because we weren't sure if that was going to work. So, but you know, it, it got, that worked. Um, we did collect, uh, we asked about multiple race and ethnicity, we asked our respondents to check, you know, we allowed them to check multiple races and then ethnicities, and that, so that was in 1995 before the 200 census that did that, um, and it worked really well, we then, you know, after they were allowed to check multiple race or ethnicity, we then asked them what was the one that they most identified with, you know, because we got these data, we said, we're patting ourselves in the back and saying, you know, aren't we great, we did this, and we said, oh my God, what do we do now, you know, we have all these data. So, you know, we force everybody into, so, you know, it just gives the, re the researcher that um, flexibility yeah. to look at, at multiple rates. About 5% actually checked, you know, multiple uh, race. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me get them in the back and then I'll get you. Hi, uh, I have a question. So if users are interested in linking uh, contextual data to our health, so what is the application procedure is? And how long will it approximately take? And like, uh, how likely is it gonna be approved by the ad house team? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I definitely will. I think so. And I actually have some slides on this in the end, so I'll answer quickly. Um, was um, we uh, the question was, do you allow um, other researchers to add ancillary data to ad health? Um, how do you do it, and how long does it take to get approved? So um, we do, uh, we have an ancillary study application on our website and, you know, researchers who are interested in adding data fill out that application, send it in. Uh, we get it reviewed by the people we think that you know, have the expertise within a particular topic. You know, and there's certain criteria, of course, that we consider, you know, if you want to just select 200 respondents and, you know, collect and get, um, 
you know, blood for them to test for some rare you know, genetic variant, you know, we're not going to be interested in that. Um, so there are some criteria that you can figure out through that ancillary. Um, and it does, it could take anywhere from maybe two to six months for approval, and you have to get that approval before you put in a grant application. But I've got some slides on that. If I, if, if I don't get to it, you guys can keep those slides, right? Yeah. Okay. I know, like, when we get the physical health data, we probably keep storing, like, a secure server. Yeah. And how do you feel about um, using, like, a remote access to that kind of data? To a secure server? It, de yeah. it depends on the, the secure server, if it's to other network. Um, it, you know, for the most part, if your security plan is using a secure server and it passes, you know, it gets approved <coughs> by us, then you can probably, then it should be no problem with remote, remoting in. It, you know, the, so the, the danger and the risk is what goes on in that secure server. If it's, you know, hooked to in a network, then it's easy for, you know, people to hack in. So that's really, so I think the remote access should work as well, especially if it's through a secure, you know, um, process. Yeah. Okay. All right, let me uh, get back here. Um, okay, so... All right, so let me, um, here's the longitudinal stuff. Um, so here's wave one that I described. Uh, here's the in-school uh, administration, 90,000 students, and then this is the in-home. I should probably put that to in-home. Uh, this is the, uh, the population to which um, Ad Health refers, the national population, it's adolescents in grades 7 through 12 in 1995. Um, you know, once we sampled from the school rosters, we ended up with 20,745. And then one parent filled out the parent questionnaire. About 85% of the parents filled out the, the parent questionnaire. There really wasn't too much bias in terms of the 50% uh, who did not, with the exception of immigrant parents who were less likely, which makes sense to fill out the parent questionnaire. Um, wave two happened one year later, 1996. We re-interviewed a school administrator to get uh, change in school context. And then we, um, we only went after the adolescents who were in grades 7 through 11 at wave 1, so we didn't follow up the seniors. Um, and that was just based on cost. Um, that was a design decision. So we end up with only about 15,000 adolescents who were then in grades 8 through 12. Um, and the story that I was going to tell is um, this was, this was what the original design of Ad Health was. It was the first five-year program project grant. Um, and we thought that was it. That was going to be it. Um, and we had proposed to collect urine and saliva, actually, at wave two, and test for STIs and HIV, because um, this was the, you know, the time of an HIV scare. Um, but we, when we pre-tested the collection of urine and saliva, the at uh, that time, we were using NORC in Chicago, and they, the interviewers just didn't like, like doing that, collecting urine. And they just didn't like the ick. You know, it was just icky. It was pretty different from the early 90s. And so they sort of sabotaged the collection. Um, they either didn't collect what they were supposed to collect, or you know, they provided their own samples, or I mean, and almost anything not to do it. So when we pre-tested it, we said, OK, this isn't going to work. So the plan was that once we collected their urine and their saliva and tested for HIV and STIs to avoid reporting at the state level, which was the question, we were going to destroy all the identifying information. And then we wouldn't be able to report. Um, but because it didn't work, we didn't destroy <laughs> the identifiers. And Ad Health was able to kind of live on. Um, so that's a sort of interesting, serendipitous sort of story. Um, and, you know, we, when we, I mean, you know, we, we were just getting the data sort of at the end of this grant, and NICHD said, well, aren't you going to collect more data? You know, don't you want to know what adolescence means for later? And, you know, we sort of said, well, I'd really rather, like, you know, analyze the data. <laughs> but, you know, when NICHD is asking for a proposal, you, you pretty much do it. Um, and so, of course, that was obviously a uh, very good, I, good reaction, too. So we had wave three. That occurred about five years later, 2001-02. You know, they're, they're now uh, in the transition to adulthood, 18 to 26. 
we did go after all of the wave one respondents, and we came with like a 77% response rate. We had a little bit over 15,000. Uh, what we did at wave three was we also had our respondents recruit their partners. So we had an algorithm that was built into the, the uh, interview. Um, and where if we found out that a respondent was in a partnership, then we randomly asked them to recruit their partner. And we had quota samples for 500 married, 500 cohabiting, and then 500 dating partners. And so that's, and then they took the whole exact same sample, uh, sorry, exact same questionnaire, also provided biospecimens. Um, let me keep an eye on the time. Uh -oh. And then wave four happened in 2008. Uh, the respondents are now really settling into adulthood, 24 to 32. We're getting a better response rate, 80%, because they're adults. They now have a credit record. We can find them. <laughs> and, um, and, then at wave, and then wave five, we just finished up, actually, in February of 2019. Um, we're just getting down the, the last, you know, agreeing to what the final N is. It's actually 12,300. Um, we, we had a follow-up of the parents, just a subset of the parents, um, over, you know, it's a 20-year follow-up, which is pretty cool. And then we have these IIB studies, and what those are is uh, for 100 respondents, we go one to two weeks later and collect a, a, a repeat sample of the biomarkers that we collect, and then we can measure the reliability. Um, if the reliability is good, then we just don't, don't disseminate them. So this is the longitudinal design. Uh, here's some of the biological data that I've been talking about um, across all the waves. We've, we've always had height and weight. So we've got, you know, we're mapping the obesity epidemic pretty well. Here's the STI test that occurred at wave three. Um, and that was the first time we collected some buccal cell DNA, um, only on the genetic sample. The, the, that genetic sample represented 3,000 pairs of adolescents um, according to their genetic resemblance. And then in wave four and wave five, we really expanded the biological um, data collection, primarily because we had techniques that were becoming uh, quite reliable and valid to collect these biospecimens in the field setting. So we have markers of metabolic, immune function, inflammation, cardiovascular. And then we, we got uh, uh, genetic data on the full sample wave four medications inventory um, and the same at wave five. Wave five, we collected some additional markers of renal um, function and kidney disease. And then the real value of ad health is just the overlaying of this, you know, incredibly rich and detailed environmental data with the biological data. And that's what makes, that's really its, con its comparative advantage compared to other sort of national studies. Um, we've been expanding the, the genetic aspect to you know, we have um, RNA data, which is gene expression data, and we're also collecting some epigenetic data. Um, and I'm trying to get a, some, a microbiome study funded. So just to return to, um, you know, the data sharing and um, the issues that, you know, we worry about, um, you know, we, we surprisingly found that this original plan that we came up with easily accommodated these additional data that we got, even the genetic data. Um, the STI, uh, STD, and the HIV results, um, and we have that, for example, on both members of that, of that couple sample, um, uh, links to the military and other administrative data, you know, all of this information, we haven't really had to change the security plan. Um, I mean, some of them may get added to that, um, the high um, security restriction, which basically is putting the data on a standalone computer that's not linked to anything else you know, with a, in a locked office. Um, just have adult data. You should be fine that way. You know, or even an external hard drive. Um, and so here to answer that question is, here was the wave three question on friends. Uh, we administered this only, you know, there only to respondents who were in grade seven through eight, because they would be the ones who had most recently finished high school at wave three, which you figured would be most salient. You know, please indicate which of the following people who went to your school are your friends now or were your friends when you were in school. Um, and then answer these questions. What's the relationship? How often you see him? What's your contact? And what we did is we actually asked Jim to, you know, we told our respondents that your responses will never be connected with your name. So remember, that was our pledge of confidentiality. 
So when we wanted to ask this question, whether or not you still see your friends, we thought, well, how can we say you know, that your responses will never be connected to your name? And by the way, are you still seeing these friends? <laughs> and so, so we struggled with this. You know, the truth is, is that probably respondents wouldn't even remember. Um, that would be a good research project, is to see what they remember from the consent forms. And, you know, um, and we thought about doing that, but we decided that we didn't want to know the answer. Yeah, we didn't want to know. <laughs> um, so we had Jim, like, you know, use the information um, where that came from the friendship nominations and all of the characteristics of their friends, as well as the individual's friends and then create an algorithm that would predict who those friends were. So the friends that we showed them, some of them really were the friends that they nominated and some weren't. Um, and you know, so this is very rich data. I think it would be interesting to look at some of these, some of the stability and change in friendship nominations. Some of the other things that we do with data security, we you know, have to keep up with technological advances. You can imagine you know, um, you know, how quickly uh, these hacking you know, skills um, and intrud intrusion um, uh, increase you know, uh, weekly, probably hourly. Uh, we have somebody who goes to the SANS Institute, uh, which is an organization that provides its, its uh, computer security training and certification and continuing training you know, sort of every year just to get you know, up to date. Um, you know, we, always try to protect against the 20 top threats, according to the SANS Institute, um, and then train all, um, our staff on this. So all in all, we've really been successful um, in disseminating. We've, uh, these are our successes. Um, there's been a lot of peer-reviewed articles um, in Ad Health in 800 different disciplinary journals, so that breadth you know, has really um, been good. Um, we figured out that a new article is based on ad health is published every day of the work week. Um, we've got tons of master's theses, um, and books, other grants, and over 200 citations to the ad health research. Um, we've got over 50,000 users around the world, and we know we know where you are. There's uh, <laughs> there's yeah. There's no security um, related to your access. Uh, <laughs> um, so the ongoing challenges, it's extremely time consuming. Um, and has a lot of uh, multiple staff demands and skills. Um, we often have to resort to this kind of custom approach. You know, for people's security plans, we keep trying to net say, you know, here's the five best. Try to pick one of these. But the one thing is we're really committed to you know, disseminating that health, not just to the big research you know, universities, but to the small liberal arts you know, colleges where they may only have one IT person for the whole college. Um, so it involves a lot of our hands-on custom approach. Um, as I mentioned, we've been educating um, uh, you know, people, um, you know, IRBs and users, investigators, as much as we can. Um, and then the challenges, of course, are the genetic data, you know, we're getting more and more, uh, you know, I think that uh, um, our genetic subcontractor told us that it only takes 13 genes to be able to perfectly identify one person. Uh, well, we've got a million, you know, we've got a million um, SNPs um, of genes. Um, but, you know, I think when it comes down to it, it's a matter of trust. You have to believe in the, uh, and trust the legal agreement that you make between the user and the University of North Carolina. Um, if everybody abides by that legal agreement, we should, you know, have no, have no trouble. Um, oh, and then, so I think these are probably the last slides, uh, the ancillary studies, which I mentioned, um, uh, you, you know, may not, researchers may propose ancillary studies to add data. You don't, you don't give access to our respondents because I don't know who our respondents are. <laughs> um, and, uh, the geographical, political, and environmental, the, uh, you know, the most common are the sort of contextual level, geographic and political, uh, via, um, and policies uh, via geocodes. Um, you can also add biological and genetic data, because we have a biospecimen um, archive. Um, we you know, review these um, proposals for scientific merit, uh, for the value and the burden to add health, and this is laid out in the application. 
for the scarcity and the amount of requested specimen, for example. And then the ancillary study, PI, has to cover all the costs, um, including at health costs to sort of check and merge the data and also do the deductive disclosure analysis. So we, you know, at the end of every wave and every time you add new data, we do a deductive disclosure analysis just to make sure that there isn't any one response that would, um, you know, by itself identify one, you know, a person, you know, in the study. If that happens, then we tend to collapse, you know, responses or fuzz the data in, in ways, you know, that don't hurt it, hopefully. Um, I think I mentioned this about the proprietary period for biological data is one year. Contextual data have no proprietary period. But, the, but you know, we do try to cut a break to an ancillary study um, investigator who, you know, goes out, uh, gets the money, gets funding for their ancillary study, you know, cre creates the data, adds the data, merges the data, you know, um, and we allow that, that ancillary study investigator to have access to the data while we continue to clean it. So it's not the final file that will be released, but for about six months they can, you know, try to run their analyses, look at descriptive data, I mean, make sure do exploratory analysis on their new data, um, you know, knowing, but they just can't publish it during those six months, knowing that, you know, it could change a little bit by the time we release it. So you do get a leg up. Um, that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Questions or comments, usually on data collection or um, introduce questions. Um, and this is supposed to be a discussion, so we'd love it if other people could look for us or for the rest of the room. Is it positive for an STI? Were they alerted oh. or? Yeah, good question. I don't know who's, I don't know who's doing what. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're. Um, yes, so that's a good question. We definitely reported the results for the STIs um, and uh, for HIV as well. We gave each respondent a phone number with a PIN and they were able to call in and get the results. And if a result was positive, we had it set up so that they could um, call, I think it was um, Awasha, you know, which was for consulting purposes. Um, surprisingly, this was at wave three, so they were, they were um, uh, 18 to 26. Um, we had a hard time getting respondents to call in. Um, less than a third, even with reminders, called in to get the results. So, um, so we actually had a, a, a research study to try to look and see, once they learned the results, if it would change their behavior and we could do the study. Yeah. Maybe Jim should answer. That's a great question. I think no, I'm uh, uh -huh. only because I think the, um, uh, nice, it's nice to have the distinction between who are your best friends, in particular, and your other friends. Um, that's an, and if you look at things like reciprocity or activity, there, it, it, there does seem to be some behavior approaches to the best friend versus the others. Um, the one thing that I would probably change, knowing what we know now, but we probably wouldn't have done differently when we started, was that we, the reason, part of the reason we did the difference between male friends and best mm -hmm. and female friends was to try to come up with a proxy for romantic relations that wasn't nearly as you know, sensitive as that asking it. Turns out that the time scales for romance relations and friendship relations are just completely different and you get almost no information from one to the other. And so in fact now by forcing them, but by essentially making it a question directly about your cross-sex friends, the um, meaning of friendship for cross-sex friends is probably different than if we just said tell us your 10 closest friends, we would get a lot, probably more gender segregation in the ties, um, but we would also get a, a greater, um, the, the, the relations might be more commensurable. So I think that knowing now that romantic relations and friendship relations don't actually mirror as much as we thought they did in, when we, before we did the study, um, I would probably now say to say who are your 10 closest friends, whereas, but I think then we, I, we'd probably still do the same thing. But if you do it now, ask for your 10 close friends. <laughs> yeah, and then ask about romantic partners separately. And separately, yeah. yeah. we tried to get it both together and list yeah. first. I think what I would love to do is get more of the friends. I mean, we got the saturated schools, right? But if we could get more of the friends in the, you know, in the in-home somehow, um, that would have been helpful too. Yeah. It's 
feet back, so. Wow, okay. <laughs> Sorry. My question is about the approach to ask for this. Um, so you said it was on top of water, or was it a free list? And what are the, okay. So it's, we'll go over this in detail in the data collection day, but the way that it helped us done was with the roster. And just to remind you all, this is a battle day from 1994. I think I have <laughs> right. a picture somewhere. But this was a scan from it, right? And we called it. So we gave, students, down. we gave the students a bound phone book that, that was sorted by grade and race. Or not grade and, grade and sex. And um, uh, you know, so I go, Jim is my friend, he's in eighth grade, and I look up Jim, and I gotta take, write Jim's name down, Jim's number down, make sure it corresponds between the two, fill in the bubbles. I mean, there's some days I wonder that we ever get any validated at all out of this, but, um, but it's, it was a real strong um, intellectual burden for students to do. And uh, so we've, we've now come much better in terms of our ways to collect data than we can get it, the way you can get to write it down, whatever. The trade off between the roster and uh, Free, free list is that the roster you actually know that the people they name exist, um, uh, whereas the free list, um, uh, if you have a small setting of um, the prosperous data, Daniel can tell us this as well. We get a free list on there of your seven closest friends, um, and there's some activities for each. Um, uh, and uh, it took a team of graduate students at Penn State three years to um, cross match these names um, uh, from the kids' names to the people who they actually were. They said, you know, that Jesus Christ was my best friend. We had to make sure there really wasn't the hate was in the school. <laughs> 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 I mean, just really, you just didn't know. So if you have a, if you have a closed setting where it's, it's feasible for you to do that kind of matching, the beauty of an open-ended response like this is it is trivial from a design to, to implement. The reason Prosper worked is that there was literally a blank page on the back of the survey that didn't have questions on it. So we said, hey, let us put a question on it, yeah. and we did. So it took no time at all from a printing standpoint or from a student fill out standpoint, but it took forever to reach out yeah, on the other side. And so that's the kind of trade off you have. Was uh, respondents that just asked once, or was that followed up to see if there was any transition or so the respondents left? Yeah, it was asked. I don't know if it was, I don't think it was asked at wave two, but it was at wave three, four. We, we didn't ask for race at least two either. Uh, do you know why your that was a very successful longitudinal study as far as like keeping people engaged over time? Um, do you have core principles or methods that you use that you think really made it work? So what was the second part? How were you so successful in keeping people engaged over yeah. time? Yeah, over time. Yeah, I mean eighty percent, like third way. Yeah. You know. Um, we, you know, we really didn't have uh, much of panel maintenance, but we would, you know, every time we'd start a new wave, we would immediately get in touch with them and send, you know, the, do the classic thing, sending a newsletter of uh, results. I think that um, we had uh, we had we had pretty good response rate because that um, I mean all this that I talked about in terms of the security plan, they really did feel, you know, comfortable, you know, and. You know, they didn't really understand the security plan, but it, we spent so much time sort of talking about it that I think they felt, you know, pretty comfortable with um, staying in the survey. Um, and they also really liked being part of the health survey that they were going to. So I, I think that that helped us a lot with this wave five. It's really a different. It's a different ballgame today. Um, there isn't as much trust. In fact, the you know this elaborate security plan that we have and the. the you know, the identifiers are outside the country. That's also actually met with more trust. Like, what do you mean my identifiers are outside the country? You know, and so things are different. Um, so that, that's one. We have, we're having a harder time keeping them engaged. Uh, they're also busier. You know, the parents, they've got kids, they're working, so it's really hard to schedule. So we're, we're meeting, you know, we're uh, facing some of those challenges on the, um, the weekend that that Cambridge Analytica thing broke. I had three respondents, we were in the field, email me personally and say that they wanted to be taken out of the survey, like, immediately. So, um, you know, I mean, I think people just think more, where's my data, what are they doing with it, who are they giving it to? Yeah. You mentioned that people didn't always know if they weren't proud of the
Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good question. You know, we talked a lot about that, um, and we decided that you know that we would have no no censorship, no like hand in um, you know how people analyze their data, and that we would re rely on the, the peer review process. So the more the biomedical <laughs> sort of studies don't do that. They you know um, some of them require that you have to work with an investigator. I mean, I think that there is definitely a lot of bad ad health research out there. So, um, and I, I hear it a lot, you know, from people, why don't I stop this? Um, especially with some of the genetic data. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's, it's a policy that, um, that we, you know, stand by. I actually, I also, also think that use of the genetic data is very new in the social science field. And that I think probably with all new data that there's always this infancy period where there's not a lot of good things going on but that people work their way out and get to the next level. And I see that happening. So, for example, the social genetic effects example. But, yeah, we definitely have not. Um, and a lot of users have asked us to create scales and tell them what scales to use. You know, we haven't, we haven't done, done that either. We, we've done a little bit of it more recently. But, um, this was one of the principles of Dick Ugrie app. The data yeah. is what the data are. Right? Yeah. And um, just to give you an example of the network standpoint, some of the adolescents nominated themselves as friends. Um, there are cell groups in the friendship band. Um, and we could have deleted those, but we left them. Mm -hmm. And there's actually been some really interesting uh, methodological studies, what, you know, some survey response kind of studies, surveyor kind of studies about what happens. So, so you know, it's, as an analyst, you have to be aware that those things are there, and it's probably a little more cleaning than you do otherwise. But it has led to the science and the things that are going to yeah, I mean, we, you know, some of the respondents, when they filled out the, um, the household roster, you know, they said that their parent was their, um, uh, you know, was their stepfather, and other parents would say that that parent was their mother's spouse. Those kids are different, the ones, um, depending on what they call their the spouse of, the, of their mother. All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Yep. Yeah. We're going to do a little bit more tech.